Greetings and felicitations. Hip hip hurrah, tally ho. Hey, Pin. <laughs> the name is Walsh, Leo Walsh. Oh, you're a liar, Mr. Walsh. <laughs> <laughs> if we had a computer here, that's what the computer would say, right? Yes. <laughs> All right, we're going to talk about Mud's Women, one of my most beloved episodes from my childhood. I mean, I, I love this on so many levels. Before we go any further, let's see what B. Joe Trimble's Star Trek Concordance had to say with regard to the episode synopsis. Okay, Mud's Women by Stephen Candle, story by Gene Roddenberry, directed by Harvey Hart, original air date October 13th, 1966. The Enterprise pursues a ship through an asteroid belt to rescue the passengers before the ship is destroyed by its own high speeds. Beamed aboard the starship are Harry Mudd, con man extraordinary, and his stock in trade, three enticing females, Ruth Bonaventure, Magda Kovas, and Eve McCuron, on their way to marry settlers on Ophiuchus 6. The ship's computer reveals that Mudd is charged with several infractions of the law. The chase has burned out most of the Enterprise's lithium crystals, and the ship heads for supply on Rigel 12, a dry mining planet with a population of three miners. Mud makes a deal with the love-starved lithium miners, their crystals for the women, and aid in escaping from Kirk. However, Eve McCuron, who has become fond of Kirk, tries to run away, and when miner Ben Childress brings her back to camp, he learns that the women have been dosed with a highly illegal Venus drug to make them beautiful. They are actually quite homely, to put it mildly, but by this time two of them are already married to miners who are actually quite satisfied with the bargain. Childress agrees to turn mud and the lithium crystals over to Kirk. Eve learns that she can be beautiful without the drugs, and since Kirk is married to the Enterprise, she settles for Ben. As for mud, they throw away the key. All right, what are your earliest memories of watching this episode? Do you have any outstanding um, memories? I, I mean, I, I remember liking it. Because as a child, you just sort of like, you, you go for the glamour and the aesthetics. Mm -hmm. And so it was, so it was, um, something, something about the women. I mean, I mean, it was alluring because it was just, it was, it was neat for a TV show to have that. It, it, it was very common back then too when I was watching it in the seventies, but it, it was something that, um, that, that I just remember thinking it was, it was a fun show to look at. And, and with Harry Mudd too, he was a fun character. Absolutely. You're right on saying glamorous because throughout the show you see them in evening gowns, even when they're on the planet. They never dusty, changed dirty clothes. planet. <laughs> yeah, they have these the same evening gowns the entire time. Uh, and also you see a lot of the soft lighting for the, the, for the women's faces. The, the soft lines, the um, oh, what, diffusion, not, the diffusion lens, filter, I that's guess they call it. The lens, <laughs> yes, the, the soft lens. Uh, very colorful lighting, colorful costumes, Harry Mudd and his larger than life personality. I agree with you a hundred percent from a kid's point of view. It was very enjoyable. And I'm going to tell you this, this is, this was an episode that I remember my father coming in the room when it was on and saying, Oh, this is another good one. Harry Mudd. And he's coming back. He's in, he's in a couple episodes. So my father knew he would just pop in for a couple minutes, watch a little bit and give some commentary on it. So I remember him saying that. And I liked it because I remember I was in first grade. In first grade, Charlie's Angels was on too. So this What made me think about this is we just went to the Mego meet where you were showing me some of the Charlie's Angels dolls that you had as a kid, remember? Yes, yes. And so thinking about Charlie's Angels because that was still on when I was in first grade. And <laughs> I thought Farrah Fawcett was so pretty. So it was around mm -hmm. that same time that I saw this episode as well. So I was like, oh my goodness, these women are so beautiful. Because they really over-glamorized them. 
It's very interesting that they had three women. Um, and I, I, I just read some ab- about this. The original idea was to have six women, but just for budget concerns, they, they lowered it to five and then four and then three. <laughs> I think three made more sense. Yes. I think it just would have been overwhelming to have six women crowding around the corridors like that. It, they, they would have been more, much more background characters if they had done it that yes. way. The way it was with the three, all of them got to, to speak, and, and so we got to look, know a little bit about their personalities. Yes, yes. Uh, one thing I was surprised, because if you look at the formula, oftentimes when they have three ladies, they do either three different ethnicities or three different hair colors, something to make each one extremely distinct beyond their personalities. So this was unique that they had two blondes and a brunette. The the blondes were different, though. They did have... Correct, different personalities. The, um, but usually, yes. visually, you see something different with, with physically. Yes, and I think they they did yeah. try to make them different. And and the fact that the, uh, the short-haired blonde was actually from, from Poland, I believe, and she had that accent. Yes, yes, and you know, she was a playmate. In Playboy, too. Yes, now, that is Now, out of the true. three, I liked the main blonde woman. What was her name? Because Maggie Eve. was... Eve. Eve, yes. Yeah, she was... She, and she was an established actress at the time, too. Mm-hmm. And now it's time for Star Trek trivia. Question number one. What type of vessel does Harry Mudd pilot at the beginning of this episode? Question number two. How much did Harry Mudd weigh the last time his records were updated? And also, now, now this episode, I, I've, you know, was trying to research it. This one is, is, of course, it's controversial. A lot of people love it. A lot of people hate it. Um, not just from the what you would call the prostitution angle, but also because of the the illegal drug angle. Mm-hmm. It had those two storylines. And it it was um, a challenge trying to get it through the NBC censors at the time. But Gene Roddenberry was able to do it. Now, the writer of this episode, he had not so much background in science fiction, but in other storytelling. Stephen Candle was a writer of um, like of television shows, and I believe at the time he was already established and having a good reputation of writing teleplays. And this one, they they now this what this script was actually first written by Gene Roddenberry, and it was one of the three scripts that he submitted to be pilots for mm-hmm. Star Trek. This one was turned down for a pilot, but but later Gene decided to give it to Stephen Candle to to make it. You know, something else, something that would be more acceptable since it was turned down the first time. And, and now Stephen Candle is the one that added the character of Mud. The original script did not have Harry Mud. I can't imagine this story without him. I know. And, and, and Mud was such a great character. And, <laughs> and of course, and he, like you said, he, he even comes back multiple times. You get, he's, he's one of the few characters he shows up twice in the original series, once in the animated series, and then in Star Trek Discovery. Yes, and, and also in a few novels, too. That's, we oh, have to absolutely. say that. Absolutely. Comic books. I mean, when you talk about the multimedia action figure, yeah, of course. He became one of the core, not villains, but well, antagonists. Yeah, yeah, an antagonist. A foil. Yeah. He, and that's what I love about Star Trek. It's not all about good and bad because you see that within Mud is that, hey, this is what these women want. They want this lifestyle. I'm simply facilitating them getting what they want. Yeah, yes, <laughs> the, and that was something that was brought out in the episode. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I believe it was Kirk that asked them, like, like, are you all doing this willingly? And they they said yes, that they were um, – um, the, the way Harry Mudd put it, he was wiving settlers. Yes. And that, that was actually – we're, we're kind of shocked at it now, but back then, especially in westerns, it was something that that was not unheard of. There that, were these lonely men, and then there were these women who who wanted to be wives because that was all that women aspired to back then was to be being a wife because that was the only way they could have a life, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And that was considered their their value. We we look at the American frontier; they say some of the most profitable businesses in the American frontier were 
the prostitution houses. Now, these women were not prostitutes. They were looking for legitimate or, or I should say, uh, like settle down situations. But you, you have men doing this hard work and they want some semblance of a home lifestyle. And if there's nothing there for women, women are looking for where the men are. I mean, it just, it makes sense for a frontier situation or for a, a mining situation. Especially when you look, now in this episode, the women also mentioned that their lives were terrible before this. Yes. So they yes. thought that being married would be a better life for them. And Eve talking about how she had to clean the mud off her brother's boots. Of course, I still wonder, getting married, she might have still had to clean the mud off her husband's boots. But <laughs> but I guess she, she thought it would be better in the husband-wife situation than she probably got less respect from her brothers. And I think of nowadays third world countries. I mean, what if you live in an absolutely desperate part of the world? You're looking for some sort of outlet. And and some some way to get out of it. Yes. Yes. So it's... I mean, I love the episode. I loved it as a kid um, when I remember first seeing it. And then in my teenage years, when I when I was in middle school, that's when I really, from 6th and 7th grade, that's when I started, uh, my family got a VCR and so started to record the episodes. And there was this kid that I was friends with that was really into Star Trek too, David. And this is one of the episodes that we love. I mean, a 13-year-old kid, of course. You're going to like the episodes with all the pretty women on it. And we love <laughs> this episode so much. So I'm looking at it from different points in my life. And when we did our rewatch now, it still holds up. It's, st it's still an enjoyable episode. And you look at the different social angles with it, and it works. I mean, it works for them. The, the, uh, I mean, let's jump ahead to the ending, the confidence issue. Confidence comes from within. I mean, as yoga practitioners, what are we taught? Stand up straight, pull your shoulders back, put a smile on your face. It's amazing. You affect yourself, your demeanor, as well as those around you. And it kind of showed that these women had it within them all this time to portray themselves in a more positive light once they had that placebo effect. That that was one of the themes when they said... um there's only one type of woman or man for that matter. You are, you either believe in yourself or you don't. Yes. That, that was a good point. E even though what in, in the show, when, when they showed Eve at the end, she took the, the fake drug and she still mm -hmm. changed and became beautiful. I mean, that was kind of like, no, nah, <laughs> it wouldn't have really <laughs> that, that happened because extreme, it wasn't. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but, but we get the idea. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and some people, don't really think it holds up as well just because of of the angle of the 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 men kept oogling at the women and but, that was extreme but I, I, that was extreme yeah, yes i i do see because when i thought about it well star trek even the the more modern star trek episodes up and up through um tng all the way through enterprise and even the jj movies they had these women that were there to be looked at oh, the jj movies were the worst the yeah and, with and, the way kirk acts tripping over things like he's never seen a woman before i mean right. it, was just, it was too stupid i mean, I mean yeah. so so even in modern times you you still do see that i think yes. discovery has been a little bit better in in its treatment of women so so uh, i will the, say the, that there is some reality to it i'm telling you what when i first laid my eyes on you i was tripping all over the place Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when you walked away and you started swaying and that music started playing. I mean, I went nuts. What, is it, music in your head or something? <laughs> <laughs> I'm convinced you had the Venus drug. Um, okay. You know what? Okay. Let, let's mention that too. About the, right. you know, you know, watching this episode in the rewatch, I was thinking it does remind me of the episode of Enterprise with the Orion women and yes. how they exuded that, that pheromone. Yes. And, and then I also read that Christopher L. Bennett, one of the novelists for Star Trek, He's great. he actually had that idea. He, he, apparently he put it in one of his books. I haven't read the book yet, but where he actually said that the Venus drug was made from the pheromones of Orion women. Oh, that's Isn't great. that a neat yeah, yeah, idea? Yeah, 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 that is, that is. Yes. I love it. I've said a hundred times before that that's what makes Star Trek so fantastic. It's not, whereas other science fiction I don't think are as good on this level because other shows that we watch, we primarily like the medium that it's designed for, whether it be the TVs or the movies. Star Trek, the entire universe of Star Trek 
I feel is better fleshed out because of the books and the comics. Because the novelist and the writers of the comics oftentimes are Star Trek fans themselves and they pick up things along the way and they they, they have all these ideas yes, yes that's isn't that ingenious i also got a kick out of uh, uh when is it ruth the dark-haired woman yes. right when she was in front of dr mccoy's medical equipment it started beeping and that, that said, was funny he yeah said, are you wearing some kind of radioactive perfume i mean what kind of <laughs> <laughs> That made no sense. He says it yes. with a straight face, like, "Why would perfume ever be radioactive?" <laughs> I, I know, but it, but it's like, and and they never really did explain how how she made his his medical monitor do that. Yes. I, I think we're supposed to think that it was the Venus drug that caused it, and I'm just guessing, like maybe because the drug maybe they're was, really like a hundred years old. Well, 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 I mean, oh, maybe. Um, let's have, I, that's thinking, I was thinking it was like, what about their physical? I didn't think they were thing. they were really that old. They I think they were just ugly, but not really. I didn't think of them as old, but uh-huh. they could have been. Um, I don't know. But, but I think the drug caused like it, it it had a way to mask itself from from medical monitors. That's what I'm okay. going to say. And so I see. Yes, so that yeah. that's what it was doing. It was masking itself so that so that McCoy wouldn't know that she was actually using the drug. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing I read about this, I mean, those costumes, of course, they were sexy. Um, actually, Gene Roddenberry went to the, the fittings when uh, Bill Tice was designing the costumes. Mm-hmm. And Gene wanted to, like, he always loved the, to watch the fittings for the women. And mm-hmm. and he actually w- had wanted to use, you know, like, less fabric and things like that, which actually kind of helped the budget <laughs> using less fabric. Mm-hmm. And um and Ruth's costume would I mean, be that's crazy to think about that. I know. <laughs> I mean, because we we are customers, we buy fabric. There's a point where if you need an extra yard, you buy the extra yard just in case. I mean, we're 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 talking how much could it cost for for an extra I, I know, foot of fabric? Right, right? six dollars. <laughs> oh my God, six dollars! We got to save six dollars. Make sure it's a little bit smaller. <laughs> that almost sounds like an excuse for me. It, it almost, <laughs> yeah, it does sound like it. But hey, we nope, don't know what we need, what exactly went nope, on. <laughs> let's take off six inches, and we'll take that six inches right over there at the cleavage part. Right, <laughs> right, and and that's another point. The um, having. You know Ruth's green dress, mm-hmm. the part that the slit that went uh, down her chest diagonally, yes. it, and it kind of looked like it made like it might fall by accident, yes. which was the idea. They thought a sexier costume is yes. one that looks like it's it might fall off. And it did in the blooper reels. There's a a, a portion where it shows her popping her titty back in. Ah. Uh. All right. Remember All the right. Blo- remember the blooper reels? I, yeah, that they I do remember seeing some. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And now for the trivia answers. Question number one. What type of vessel does Harry Mudd pilot at the beginning of this episode? The answer, a small Class J cargo ship. Question number two. How much did Harry Mudd weigh the last time his records were updated? The answer, 240 pounds. So, so also in this script, you know how Kirk acted a little different. I mean, Eve came on to him, and he he did not reciprocate. Yes, he and, was yeah. angry. He was frustrated. He, he was. Yeah, he had a lot going on then. So. Well, this was also because this was an earlier episode, and they had not established the Kirk as as more of a ladies' man. They did. Yes. They were not writing him that way at this That's time. That's right. That's right. I mean, he was. They made. Remember, Harry Mudd said it. He's married to the ship. You're not going right, to get anywhere right. with him. Now, now at the beginning, oh, oh, yeah, another thing I read about this was the chase scene at the beginning. They they added that so that they could have more action in the show because there really wasn't much action after that. It makes sense. But but now, oh oh, and talking about the lithium crystals, yes. I, I know I read something in I think it was in the making of Star Trek how they started out like Gene thought he made up the word lithium, mm-hmm. then he found out it, that it's a real word. It's actually mm-hmm. an element. Mm-hmm. So they came up with dilithium later on. Mm-hmm. Now my in head canon because this is the second time where no man has gone before. So it's this where no man has gone before, and then going forward we know it as dilithium. In my head canon, lithium is just slang term for dilithium 
So it's one of those oh, it Marvel. Could be. It's one of those Marvel no prize things. You you take something that's inaccurate, but you make it in universe accurate. So that's, so so that's it was what like they they just shortened the word. They were sort of using like a slang term. Correct. Like we'll just call it lithium because it yes. it's fewer syllables. Yes, yeah. And I was hoping because we did. We'll talk about it later. But we did the reading of the novelization of this episode. I was hoping that J. A. Lawrence would have the same mindset as me and put a little apostrophe and put lowercase l for lithium, but no, it's capital L for lithium. So nowhere okay. nowhere but inside <laughs> my mind is lithium short for dilithium. Okay. <laughs> but it could have been I, I think there has been people have tried to explain it by saying that, that they did use lithium at first and later uh-huh. they were able to use or make dilithium. Uh-huh. And so, so that's why it became dilithium later. It makes sense. But, but also in the chase scene, the, and the way the Enterprise was crippled after that, that that didn't seem right either. Because, you know, they, they were chasing this small ship, mm-hmm. and and like if the Enterprise couldn't handle that, then how did they handle you know the Romulans ship. later? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> it wasn't even a battleship, right? Oh, oh, and another thing that the um, the computer being a lie detector for Harry Mudd. Mm-hmm. When was that ever used again? The computer as a lie detector. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, mm. because it would have ruined a lot of um, plots later on if they had used it again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I liked it when. That's the beauty of having everything crystal clear now, and having big screens because this is we're able to zoom in on Harry Mudd's file. And see the details about him. Yes. And if you notice that they use the reverse image of Harry Mudd. Because throughout the show, Harry has his earring hanging on his left ear. But on the computer image, the earring is on his right ear. Okay. Well, maybe when the police p- took the picture, they wanted it that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, and we do have to mention, you know, Harry Mudd. Of course, you said he came back, but on Discovery, you know, it, it was almost like he was a different person on Discovery. He mm-hmm. just had the same name, but he was he was mm-hmm. so different. He was on Discovery. Shocking, he shocking was, they screwed I up know. something with Discovery. <laughs> Boy, um, so so in Mud's Women, he was the 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 rogue. He was more like a petty thief on mm-hmm. Discovery. He was a he was more of a hardened criminal. I mean, and he yes. was more intelligent. He could, you know, mm-hmm. trying to to learn how to how to work things on the ship. And um, killing Lorca, those mm-hmm. kind of things. Um, but but I do want to say also in Mud's Women, it seems like Harry Mud was not as much of a comedic character as he was used in the episode I Mud. Oh, by far different. Yeah, same writer. Right. Right. Which I love it when Star Trek does that. They take a someone who ha- they did it with David Gerald as well with his Tribbles creation, but to take the writer and say, okay, Mud has changed a little bit over the years, not too far off from the character. Because he's still the same goofy kind of guy. Yes. But, but but there is some growth in the character. It, and when he comes back later, and of course we'll talk about it when we get to that episode, but mm-hmm. he was he was more the lovable rogue yes. in, in IMUD. In this episode, he was a little more serious. Yes. He, he still had that wise guy attitude towards him, though. He did. As, as, well, I mean, mm-hmm. his, his last line at the You've end. You've been there for one or two days. You can't remember that you had to lift a mattress up. To put oh, the I pills know. <laughs> under there? Like, how absent-minded can you be? Yes, yeah. <laughs> but at the end saying, they'll throw away the key. I yeah. mean, that that was his, that was really his funny, funniest line in it. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, and totally. since you mentioned the trouble with Tribbles, uh, the character Cyrano Jones, wasn't he just like Harry Mudd? Yes, I mean, yes, yes. That, that was just something like, wow, that David Gerald could have just used Harry Mudd in that episode. But I guess I don't think they I, thought you know of what? it. I could be wrong. And... I thought at one point that was a consideration. I could be wrong, but I thought that was a consideration. I okay. can't remember if it was a fan theory or it was actual. You know, we read so much stuff, I, it I starts muddling what, what is real and what is not. But, yeah, that's a thought. Another thing that I liked is that we see Uhura's wearing the gold uniform. Still, because she yes. wore it in uh, Corbomite my Maneuver. Yes. And I'm wondering to myself, like, what I like with things like that, kind of like when we saw Sulu wearing the blue, we see job changes. We see progress. So Uhura was possibly thinking to go on the command track, but now she's like, you know what? I'm, I have an aptitude with languages. 
I really want to follow this career path instead. Oh, that's a good idea. Yes. Mm-hmm. And and also, the, this episode had Lieutenant Farrell. Yes. And he was the navigator. He was on how many episodes? I think he we've seen him before a few mm-hmm. other times. But um, y- you know what I kept thinking about him? Looking at his face, wh- when you watch the animated series, you know how they had Lieutenant Rx, the, the one with the three arms and three legs. because oh, yeah, he has that long neck with a big Adam's apple. Yeah, and, I think yes. I, it's almost like they designed that cartoon <laughs> character based on Farrell. It's, it's possible. <laughs> Um, and another thing about the women in this episode, I, I really think they, they weren't um, stupid. They were actually smart. Um, Harry Mudd sent out the women to, to get more information because he was confined to his quarters, right? But you have mm-hmm. Ruth and Magda. They were pumping the um, the men for information, and mm-hmm. they were able to get mm-hmm. it without the men being suspicious. And, of course, the men were, were – um, distracted too by their beauty but but they were able to get the information and and i kind of see it like you know what i think those two women like if this was was written in modern times yes. ruth and magda could have been like harry mudd would have re- would have recruited them to be like um cohorts of his and yes. they would be pickpockets or information gatherers uh-huh. and then later on they would discover hey we don't need harry mudd we can do this on our own mm-hmm. you know and and but I but I like that aspect thinking about it and and also even even with Eve McCuron now now she wouldn't be Harry Mudd's cohort because she was she was resistant to the Venus drug she didn't like it mm-hmm. but she was intelligent too she was the one that had the idea to tell uh, Ben Childers to um to hang the the pots and pans outside and let the sand blast them clean <laughs> I know hey who makes you your breakfast you that's right. I would have never have thought of that. <laughs> and I'm, I have pots and pans all the time. Yeah. So. Isn't it amazing? Yeah. It is. It is. And, and I love how, and you can tell that Eve and Ben had this chemistry together. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, they had their fights. They fought all the time, but they, but you could tell that they were going to get together. I think he was fascinated by her. That's why he kept coming back to talk to her. Yeah. And, and so, and so you have that. And the fact that, that she, um, she she wanted she did want to get married, but she did not want someone who was interested in her for her looks. Mm-hmm. So, so I, I like that aspect of it too. Mm-hmm. And in the rewatch, you just you notice these things like okay, mm-hmm. some some of it is um I thought he it's was still annoying, on track. Though. Oh, isn't this wonderful? The best food I ever had by a woman's hand. Or like some, like, <laughs> I oh know. I God. think he was. I, I tell you what, I would take in that say make your own. Exactly. Dump it on his yeah. head. Dump it on his head. Make your own. Then. Well, that's why she said yeah. lo- a lot of it is your cooking. Yeah. <laughs> but I think, yeah, he went into it not really wanting to like it. Was mm-hmm. was the idea? But then, but he kind of did, you know. Mm-hmm. Oh, I think the, there was the reaction after he took his first bite. You could tell that he he was surprised at how good it was. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's think about it when we look at this episode for what it is. What do we think about it overall? with it, how it affects the Star Trek universe. I, I mean, in a lot of ways, like, like we just said, because Harry Mudd was a continuing character. Mm-hmm. Um, but but also because it does have the theme of, of believe in yourself and have confidence and you don't need, you don't need anything exterior to, to make yourself worthwhile. Yes. It, it had those messages. This is the first time that it reinforces what is Captain Kirk's first love. His ship. His That's command, right. exactly. And this theme is going to follow through the entire series of how important the Enterprise... Within time, the Enterprise becomes a character in herself. She the does. Importance. When, when you, yes. Yeah, you, we see that later on. So this was good character development early, mm-hmm. early in the series. Yes. And because of so many times that Harry Mudd does pop up, this is part of the Star Trek canon that we revisit over and over again and still enjoy yeah mud was in the he was also in the novels and the comic books too mm-hmm. i mean he was yeah he was used a lot all right so let's talk about the first story in mud's angels adapted by j.a lawrence we know that the original james blish novels or what would you call the James Blish novels? Since adaptations. Adaptations. Right. That's more of what they are, yes. Uh, they followed every episode of the original series, with the exception of two, Mud's Women and I, Mud. 
and it's collected these two as well as a bonus story are collected in the volume Mud's Angels. Yeah, James Blish um, unfortunately died of cancer before he could write these these last two adaptations. So, I, oh, well, he did start on them, but his wife finished them, and so they were compiled in in this book. And and I, I like the very beginning, the way they framed the story. They said that um, what that you know that that Kirk and crew had seen Harry Mudd twice or maybe three times, right? And but but they. They wrote the reports for Starfleet, but the report was very dry because it had to be facts only. Mm -hmm. And they had this idea, well, let's give it to – there's a, a person on the ship called an integrator who, who was, I guess, just a passenger at the time. Mm -hmm. Let's ask this integrator named Lawrence if she wants to – write this up and make know, it entertaining it stories. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that was a great frame story. It was a neat idea. It is. And I like also in the preface it said they would have used material from – the animated series in here, but legally they couldn't. Right. Which I view the animated series as canon. Me, view, me too, yeah, exactly. I view Lieutenant yeah. Erex as a member of the ship, Lieutenant Mires as a part of the ship. Of course, that's going to be the, the years four and five, possibly, somewhere within that era. But So it did make mention of that, that the only reason why uh, that era of Harry Mudd was not in this volume is because of legal reasons. But what'd you think about the adaptation? Um, it, it was, it was pretty much, it was very close to the episode. Now, now one thing about it, because I think because it was a story and because it was not visual, mm -hmm. they kept saying Harry Mudd was fat. It kept saying that he's fat. And I just thought, I, I mean, you know, he's, he's not really, he's not as fat as some other characters we've seen on this I'll show. I'll tell you what, for the 1960s, that was fat. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you, you look at, I remember, uh, what was it? What's happening, right? Yeah. With, with the uh, rerun. Yes. Right? He was the one that was the butt of all the fat jokes in the 80s, right? Okay. Yes. I know 100 people his size now, that, and that's considered it, it's, normal. Like he, Yeah, it's a little like more that, standard now. Absolutely. Right. But when we were kids, that was considered obese, so, it, it was. So it for, was. So, so, it, so it's so like, say yeah. For that time period, Harry Mudd. He was a big guy. A big I mean, boy. he was yeah. tall. Yeah. And of course, and we've got his, his height and weight in, on we, his we ID. We shot it on, this, on the yeah. ID. Six foot one, 260 pounds. Yeah. Sure. So, uh, but this was different than all the other James Blish because the other James Blish were based more on the scripts. So you had some details that were a little bit different than the TV version mm -hmm. whereas this it looked like she sat in front of the tv and just wrote line for line some yeah, of the quotes it, we I, we didn't really learn anything new from reading this mm -hmm. now, and, and one thing about reading it, it it seemed like it didn't it didn't flow as well because i think it, when when the show changed from one scene to another mm -hmm. that the story doesn't make it obvious that they changed from one scene to another i, I think some it, i think she kind of had some things running together mm -hmm. yeah Hey, it's a great part of the collection, and it's it's always fun reading the written version. Yes, yeah, it's, it's not that it was After. bad, but I think it it yeah since it doesn't really flow as well if you haven't seen the episode though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, we had a fun time reviewing this, and since the comic appearances of Harry Mud are all post I Mud, we'll discuss the comic appearances once we get to that episode. All right, can't wait. Thanks for listening. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and join our Facebook group. Live long and may the force be with you. Nanu Nanu.